Welcome back. And today we're going to talk about authorization. Now, if you remember from our previous discussions, when we talked about that triple A concept or triple A process, authentication, authorization, and accounting, well, the actual first step before those three A's get to happen is identification. So identification is when you just present a, a username, an email address, some sort of an identifier that uniquely identifies you as a user or as a person, as a real person. So that's the first step, identification. Then comes authentication. This is where you have to actually prove that you are who you claim you are. How do you do that? Well, you present some sort of a secret information, some sort of a key, a password, a passphrase, a certificate, something that only you should have or know or be able to use, right? That's the second step, authentication. And then the third step, authorization. That's very important because after the authentication system identifies you as a valid user with a valid user account, well, the next question that comes in is, what are you allowed to do, All right? We know who you are, but what kind of resources can you access? What network destinations can you access? Where can you create new files? Are you able to edit existing files on specific network destinations, All right? Are you able to communicate with some outside destinations or only with local um, entities, All right? So all, all these questions are actually included in what is called an authorization policy or what are you authorized to do? Now, as you can imagine, over the time, people have had a number of different ideas regarding how can we actually describe or have some sort of a list of permissions of, um, of author authorized processes or authorized actions that can apply to a user. And even where do we apply that list? Do we apply the list to the user? So we say that this user has access to A, B, and C, or do we apply the list to the actual objects being accessed and we say on that object that only uh, Andrew, George, and Michael can access it? All right, so how, how do we design this authorization system? And the answer is, well, it depends because we have a number of methods of doing so. Now, all these methods, uh, I would like to warn you from the very beginning, these are purely theoretical models. In real life implementations, even though there are implementations that actually follow these models, most of them actually combine them somehow, right? So this is just the difference between theory and practice. So let's see the first one. Now, the first one, it's not necessarily the simplest one, but it's the one that everybody is most uh, comfortable and familiar with, and that is called discretionary access control. Well, just like the name says, discretionary means it's at your discretion or at the user's discretion, who else has access to a specific resource, which is exactly what happens in our Windows and Linux and Mac OS networks nowadays, where you create a file, you can put it on the network, you create a folder, and you can right click on that folder and set some security permissions, like who you wanna give access to that location. Do you wanna give everyone access? Do you wanna give only uh, a specific person from a specific department or organizational unit access to it? So, right, so if you are the owner of that resource, if you created that resource, then you are the one responsible for providing additional access to it. And that is discretionary access control. Usually it's implemented using ACLs, access control lists. That is, if you right click on that object in Windows and you would go to the folder's properties. For example, you would see something like this, which is a simplified version of that access list that is currently applied on that folder. If you go over to the advanced section, you're gonna see some more in here. This, this is the actual access list that you see right here. It has three entries. All of them are of type allow. Two of them refer to groups. One of them refers to my current user right here. And we can choose and add and remove and modify these permissions however we want because I'm the owner of this specific object, which in turn is, my, uh, is the folder that stores all the <laughs> <laughs> PowerPoint slides uh, for this training. So that's discretionary access control. It's the most implemented method of providing access in all the file systems and operating systems nowadays. Role-based access control is another one that is quite easy to understand because we can find it everywhere, especially in enterprise networks nowadays. But with role-based access control, we, we kind of move that discretionary part into a more centralized method of providing access. And what we mean by this is that you're not granting specific users access to a specific resource, but instead users automatically inherit access and permissions to all the resources that they need simply by being a member 
of a specific group in some identity management system, right? Like in AD, for example, in Active Directory, if you are a member of the development group in a company, then you probably have access to the code repositories. If you are a member of HR group, then you probably have access uh, to all the Excel files and uh, all the personnel policies are stored. Of course, a person can be a member of multiple groups, in which case they're going to inherit permissions from multiple groups and they don't have access to uh, a multitude of destinations and resources all over the network. But the important thing to remember here is that with role-based access control, you're not in charge anymore. The system, quote unquote, is in charge. Well, in most cases, that's going to be the admin or the IT department, which actually creates those security policies. But they are the ones that define the groups, define the group membership, and also they define uh, what kind of permissions they are assigning to those groups. Now, a big benefit of this approach, especially in large environments, in large companies and enterprises, is that whenever a, a new member uh, needs to be added to a team, you don't have to you know, think about, well, we're hiring a new person right here as a developer. What kind of access should we give to him, right? Uh, should he be able to access code repositories, maybe uh, maybe some virtualization software to run some tests, maybe uh, maybe a ticketing application and so on and so forth, right? So we, we skip all that simply because we know that everybody who is a member of the development group already has access to those, to those resources. So all we need to do is to just add the user ID, the new user that we just hired and added to the network. We just have to make it a member of the development group and they're automatically going to inherit all the necessary permissions. But of course, this is not something that the new hire can do or even his colleagues, right? The IT department has to do it. Mandatory access control is, I would say, the most basic example of an access control system, but it's not exactly implemented uh, so widely nowadays. Its origins come from the military environment, and an example of uh, such a, an implementation, if I can call it an example, is uh, if you think about you know spy movies, James Bond, for example. You know James Bond has access to a document, um, even though the document has top secret clearance, right? It requires a top secret clearance and James Bond has access to the document because James Bond also has a top secret clearance. Well, you never thought about it this way, but this is an implementation of a mandatory access control actually. And the way it works is that we're assigning some labels to the objects that people need to access. So we have a folder on the network, have a server, we have an application, something that needs to be accessed, we apply a label to it. And well, that label is gonna be a type of security clearance, such as, I don't know, confidential, secret, top secret, and so on, depending on you know the environment you're working in. Commercial terminology might be different from military one, of course. And then when a person tries to access that resource, uh, the access control system is going to evaluate the clearance level of that person and try to match it with the clearance level of the resource, right? So if James Bond can access a top secret document, it means that James Bond has top secret clearance. If James Bond did not have top secret clearance, only had, I don't know, confidential clearance, for example, he wouldn't be able to access that specific resource. Now, of course, this implementation also requires a centralized uh, decision point and also a centralized point of management uh, from where all these labels come from. So it's not up to James Bond to assign a specific clearance to that document. And also it's not up to James Bond if he wants to share that document with somebody else. Well, that somebody else will also need to have top secret security clearance as well. All right, so it's strictly, strongly centralized. It's the definition of a centralized access control model, right? That's mandatory access control you're not allowed or entitled to change any of these labels or to change your own security clearance, of course. Everything is managed centrally by the system. Now, there's a lot more to be discussed here about mandatory access control, but this is more uh, on the, uh, let's say, the level of the CISSP exam. Don't really have to know that much for Security Plus. Just to mention this one here because it's on the slide, you can also enrich this decision process using partitions. A partition would basically be something that uh, would mirror a group membership. So we could have some objects that require secret or top secret security clearance to access, but they would also belong to a specific partition such as, I don't know, internal affairs or uh, <laughs> overseas espionage, right? Uh, back to James Bond here. So if you're not a member of that partition, you won't 
be able to access that resource, even though you might have the proper security clearance. Now, attribute-based access control is, uh, I wouldn't say completely different from the others, but it's a way to enrich the decision process. What do I mean by this is that whenever you're uh, evaluating a user for, in order to decide what type of permissions it needs to receive, right? You're probably gonna be looking at the username, validating the password, and once you know who the user is, well, then you're going to assign a specific set of permissions to it. Well, this process could be made a bit more, well, complicated, of course, uh, by looking at additional factors, such as where is the user connecting from? Is the user local in our local network or is it connecting over a VPN? Uh, is the user uh, using a company approved device or is the user connected using its, uh, his or her own personal phone on a Starbucks Wi-Fi? Right? So we can add a bunch of parameters in here, including time of day, uh, geographic location, the posture, the, uh, the operating system that the, uh, the device uh, currently has and it's using. So a lot, of, a lot of additional factors in here that could help us uh, choose a specific security policy that we assign a specific set of permissions that we assign to that user. So for example, uh, we might grant users full permissions if the user is local on inside of the building using a company approved device, but we might uh, choose to restrict the user's access if it's located overseas and using a non-approved device because you know the risks are higher. So let's not give all the necessary permissions to that user because things might go bad. Finally, rule-based access control, the weirdest one in here because it's not exactly a separate category. It's basically any kind of system that is controlled by a centralized brain or a centralized system where the rules are defined in a centralized location and you have no saying over those rules. That's a rule-based access control. Uh, an example of a rule-based access control or the, let's say, number one example you're gonna find in all the documentation out there is a firewall. All users go through the firewall or their traffic traverses the firewall, but they have no influence over how that firewall behaves or how the rules of that firewall are defined. The rules are there, you just have to play by the rules. Another, uh, let's say, corner case implementation of rule-based access control is a continuous monitoring solution or a uh, conditional access solution. Uh, that is a type of security system that monitors users' behavior even after they have successfully logged in and authenticated inside of the network. Are they behaving the way they should? Are they following a predefined or pre-recorded baseline? Or, or are they behaving erratically like an attacker, right? That would be a type of rule-based access control. We're basically trying to match the behavior of that user over the entire duration of their connection session to see if it does trigger specific alarms and rules and intrusion rules that might indicate that the user is not exactly our user, but it's an attacker that has compromised a real account. And another, let's say, uh, not so obvious definition or implementation of rule-based access control is privileged access management or PAM. Now, privileged access basically means all the actions that admins and root users are allowed to perform. And of course, those accounts are really powerful because they have control over the entire network or each individual system. So managing what exactly are those admins allowed to do is a pretty important topic, especially if the company strongly relies on its IT infrastructure. If, if, an, uh, if an admin one day suddenly decides to destroy the entire network and erase all the hard drives and all the backups, well, that's probably not something that you want happening. <laughs> it might be because they are intentionally trying to do this or because their account might have been compromised. So there's an entire set of rules. That's why we're talking here about this in the rules based access control section. Uh, an entire set of rules that say, well, even though the admins have supreme privileges and they can do anything, this set of rules actually says what they should be doing. Right, <laughs> so if you get the uh, the idea here, is that we're trying to restrict somehow the uh, normal behavior of an admin user, even though they have absolute power inside of a network, so that they don't do any harm. So that's privileged access management, part of rules-based access control. Now, since we're talking about larger companies and enterprise world, it's absolutely necessary to mention directory services. Now, directory service 
is basically a database. Even if somebody tells you otherwise, that's the ultimate level of oversimplification that you, you can apply to this concept. It's basically a database of users and hosts and uh, network locations and permissions and access lists and everything that is defined in one single place where everybody refers to, everybody refers to that single database whenever they log into the network, whenever they access resources to the network, whenever they receive a access denied message from the network, that message comes from a decision process that takes into account this directory services database. Most common type of directory service, Active Directory, right, from Microsoft. Two things you need to remember here, because we're not gonna go into too much detail, is X500, that's the de facto standard for defining a directory service. So that's the standard directory service definition. Also LDAP, that's the protocol, lightweight directory access protocol, that's the protocol that we're using to access this directory database. Now the way this database is structured is of course hierarchical and each entry in that database is basically an object. An object refers to a person, a user, a device, a location in the, inside of a network. And those objects are actually characterized by attributes. And well, some of the most common attributes that you're going to find are as follows. We start with CN, that's the common name of the actual resource that we're accessing. We have organizational units, OU. We have organization as a capital O. We have C for the country or DC for the domain component. And an example of a resource definition inside uh, our directory service would look something like this. We have a common name of web server. That's the resource, a server that serves web content. Uh, we have the part of the organizational unit called training, part of the certified breakfast organization located, let's say in US and it's part of a domain that has two components. We have one domain component, Certified Breakfast, and, one, and another one, uh, which is called COM. So what we can read here is that a resource called a web server that is operated by Certified Breakfast in the US, and it's part of the training organization unit, is accessible at certifiedbreakfast.com. Now, all this user management business works quite well, but only inside of our own network. This is where we define our users, their permissions, who has access to, to what kind of resource and so on. But what if uh, we need to go outside of the network? Let's say that a company needs to collaborate with partners, with suppliers, with other branches even. Maybe they're, they're merging with another, another company and they, they need to, to merge their own user databases. So this is where a concept called federation comes into play. Now federation, long story short, basically means trusting the users and their permissions created by some other company, by some other identity management system. Now, a very common type of federation that you can see happening all over the place, over the internet, is when you're able to log in into a specific website using your, your Facebook account, your Google account, your uh, Amazon account, or whatever account that might be allowed by that website, even though the website has nothing to do with uh, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, or whatever identity provider they're choosing to trust. But they are trusting the users defined by Facebook. They are trusting the users defined by Google. So that's a federation type of relationship between that website and the actual identity provider. So one network's identity provider can provide attestation or proof of its user identities to another network's identity provider. So these two networks, in order to be able to share their user identities and trust uh, one another's users, well, they need some sort of a method of communicating this information or some sort of a protocol to communicate uh, who is this user, what type of permissions uh, the user has, uh, what's its unique identifier and stuff like that. And all that is happening over the internet using the SAML protocol or the security assertion markup language. And all these details are implemented over the internet under the uh, designation of SAML, that's security assertion markup language. So it's a specific language, it's basically an XML language, right, that describes all this uh, identity information. And one thing to remember here is that the actual authorization operations included in this SAML language are officially called attestations. On a more technical level, the actual communication is happening over the traditional HTTP or HTTPS protocols, or sometimes over the SOAP protocol suite. 
And of course, since we are receiving information that we need to trust from a third party, then we actually have to ask ourselves, well, how do we trust that third party? How does it prove its identity to us? Well, we come back here to the concept that we've previously covered, which is digital signatures. So all these assertions sent over the SAML language are always going to be digitally signed so that we know we can trust that information that is coming from Facebook, Amazon, Google, and so on. Now, a specific use case and a specific implementation method for applications is when those applications are running inside of some cloud or they're just running over the internet, right? And when those applications expose an API, an application programming interface, usually APIs are leveraged by third party tools or other applications in order to be able to exchange data between applications. And all this authentication and authorization business now focused on the API itself, which in most cases is going to be a REST or RESTful API, is going to be performed and implemented using the OAuth protocol. And the main purpose behind OAuth is to let you share identity information or user information between two different websites or two different applications. This allows a user that has defined an identity profile in one website using one identity provider to use the same information, to use the same profile to authenticate in a different application without ever delivering or sending its password to that second application. So the user is still authenticating to its own or parent identity provider because that's where, that's the database where its profile is defined, but the credentials are never sent to the actual application where we're trying to authenticate. Uh, let's take an example here if I'm trying to log in into uh, IMDB, right, the uh, Internet Movie Database, using my Facebook profile, I can log into Facebook, I can choose to log in using Facebook in there, but I'm never going to be sending my Facebook password to IMDB, right, I'm only authenticating to Facebook and IMDB trusts Facebook so that when Facebook sends a confirmation back to IMDb saying that me, Andrew, have been successfully identified and authenticated to Facebook, then IMDb is gonna be able to use my profile information to authenticate and create perhaps a different profile in its own application, in its own environment and database. The actual implementation, of course, is much more complicated. It also relies on specific uh, flows or grants in which we have a different flow when an application tries to authenticate to a different application or when a, a, an external user or a mobile device user is trying to authenticate to that application. You might also find the OAuth authentication process implemented using authentication tokens, where you first register and request a token, which kind of works like a temporary password, and then you use that token into all subsequent requests that you plan on sending while interacting to that specific REST API. And another detail that might help you on the exam is the fact that OAuth is based on JSON payloads. And finally, another concept here that is worth mentioning is the fact that OAuth, even though it leads you to think about open authentication, it's actually open authorization. It doesn't authenticate, it just communicates authorization information, permissions, that's it. Uh, which is another way of saying that once we're generating that authorization token, we don't know who uses it, right? It's not connected to a specific identity or a digital identity. That token might be generated by one person and then used by another one, and OAuth has no method of differentiating between uh, these two use cases. So that's why we say that OAuth has no authentication knowledge or information. Well, for this, in order to ensure that we also have authentication in place, we have OpenID Connect. And by the way, OpenID Connect, different protocol that can be implemented as a subflow inside OAuth. That's why in many cases and documents and articles online, you might find people saying that no, OAuth does support authentication. Well, it, it does, it just doesn't support it out of the box. It's one of the additional flows that it can support. And those additional flows are actually not OAuth, but they're called OpenID Connect. And I know this is, this is kind of confusing here. OAuth is about authorization and OpenID Connect is about authentication. And it's probably not the first thing that comes into, you, into your mind whenever you think about these two terms, but that's how they are. Finally, one last element here that's worth mentioning, and we've been talking about authentication authorization in the digital world, but let's not forget that we are in a security training. And the first thing <laughs> should everybody know is that 
the human link is most likely the weakest one in any security implementation or lack of. So it's extremely important to make sure that you also have proper authorization policies implemented at your personnel level, that your employees know about their rights, their permissions, um, what their access should be and how they should behave inside of your company. And one of the most basic and widely known types of policies that describe how an employee is allowed to behave is called an acceptable use policy, AUP. And that's exactly what the name says. It's a policy that lists the acceptable actions that an employee can perform, especially when using equipment and devices that belong to the company. It's one of those policies that say you're not allowed to um, to run uh, file sharing software or you're not allowed to install pirated software or you're not allowed uh, to use the, the company hardware for running your own personal business, for example. So that's an acceptable use policy. Sometimes this policy is referred to as a code of conduct, which is a more elegant way of saying how you should behave professionally in the office, right? <laughs> And from a security perspective, it means security awareness, uh, being careful how you handle data, how you share that data, who you give access to that data in a discretionary access control model, right? Uh, keeping a, at a minimum, at least, a knowledge and an open mind as to where digital risks and attacks uh, might emerge from. And this code of conduct is of utmost importance, especially in positions where uh, users have uh, higher privileges, like admin users, um, IT technicians that can change the configuration of the network, of the devices inside of the network, and eventually can actually change the security posture of your company. So there's a lot of risk involved in there, which means that we have to kind of keep those people under control <laughs> just in case someday uh, some of them decide to do something nasty. So speaking of security, security awareness is a big topic and most HR departments should be concerned with this. And security awareness is something that should apply from the most basic user, the users that probably don't have anything to do with the technical part or the, uh, let's say, the, the, the technical focus of the company up to the actual uh, IT engineers, right? And the network and application database engineers that have a lot of privileges and their daily jobs involve interacting with IT systems. So everybody should be at least aware of potential risks involving IT equipment and the data that they're handling. And just to list a couple of things that are most likely going to be covered by your HR department when it comes to disseminating and making sure that there is a certain level of security awareness happening inside of your company is first to start with making sure that everybody understands what a security policy is and what a security policy says, right? So that everybody knows how to behave according to that security policy, which means that security policy is probably gonna be written in a language that is accessible to all employees. And I'm not talking about English, I'm talking about the technical details <laughs> required and technical understanding required uh, to read and understand and apply that security policy. Next up, we need to be sure that people know how to identify or at least report, if not security incidents, then at least suspicious events that might lead to actual security incidents. It should be 100% clear for everybody else uh, where exactly an incident should be reported and how. Next, we have to make sure that everybody knows about security procedures that apply to their specific job roles. Uh, we need to enforce some password policies because uh, users most likely are not gonna be really focused on generating strong and very secure passwords. So we might have to enforce this on a centralized level for the entire company. Uh, data protection policies, again, because most companies, if, if not all the companies actually, right? Any IT company actually works not with equipment, but works with data. So security is at the end of the day, all about securing data. How do you handle that data? How do you store it? How do you transmit it? Who do you give it to? And where do you leave it in plain sight if you forget about it? All these things have to take into consideration the fact that that data might contain sensitive information.
All right, so that's data protection policies. Uh, next up, we might want to look into conducting some phishing campaigns with a PH, right, phishing, uh, which uh, in turn is going to prove or disprove the <laughs> level of security awareness that is currently inside of your company, right? We're trying to um, run some sort of a social engineering campaign and see how many users actually fall for it right that's anti-social engineering trainings and finally anti-piracy awareness which should probably be a big topic in most companies because most companies don't allow or desire pirated software to be installed on their own computers it's not just risky but also illegal and i don't think i need to mention this because hr departments pretty much know this or they should know this right uh, some of the methods that allow us to increase security awareness inside of a company are these phishing campaigns that we just talked about small contests such as capture the flag these are most likely focused on the it department uh, where we're trying to reach a certain goal right we have a small competition here between teams and of course we have the good old and sometimes boring trainings, computer-based trainings or instructor-led trainings, remote, on, on site, whatever type of training you have, uh, don't forget about those as well, right? Even YouTube trainings, right? I heard about some guy with a certified breakfast channel that uh, says some interesting stuff about security. Maybe you should check it out. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty much it for, uh, for this lesson today. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this informative and interesting. And if you want to discuss some more, please leave a comment in the comment section, of course. Uh, like and subscribe if you want to subscribe and if you liked it, of course. And then see you on the next video. So good luck. See you next time. Bye bye.